Okay, we've got something really exciting to have a look at today. We've got not one, but three National NV850, or Panasonic, depending on where they came from and at what time. This is a, I guess it was fairly high-end, it was quite a popular Hi-Fi Stereo VCR VHS, and it's got three screens on it, which makes it extra exciting. One just for the level displays and hi-fi tracking, one for the tape transport, and one for the counter timer and tuner. There's additional controls under this door. Microphone input. Exciting. And there's a manual audio level control. And all the other bits and pieces that you normally find. Also a audio track selector for the sound hi-fi sound, whether it's stereo or only left or right or normal. It's using mechanical push buttons. There's a tuner in there. And this machine, put the service manual here. As far as I can tell, it's based on the NV370. It appears to have the same mechanism in it, and most of the circuit boards are very similar. We'll take a look at one of these in another video sometime in the future. I don't have the service manual for this model, but I've got this service hints, which gives you some ideas of common things that go wrong and flowcharts to help work it out. And some nice block diagrams to help troubleshoot things. But well, we've got the full service manual for this NV850. Should be able to give that a go. Let's have a look at what's on the back. Get the RF input and output, the audio in and out, and video in and out, and a camera pause remote connector. Let's try these out and see if any of them work. I'm pretty sure two of them have faults that mean they don't power up properly, and the other one, I think it was working, but I'm not sure. I don't know if it was working very well. This one got new heads in 1990, and yeah, I don't know if it was used much since then. I guess we can have a look and find out. Okay, we're going to start with this one. The This isn't the one that I think works, and the other one that has got stuff rattling around inside it, so I think it's partially dismantled, so we'll leave that one aside. Maybe that one will be good for parts. We'll take the top off of this one, take a look inside it, and then we'll uh, try turning it on and see what it does. I'm guessing these are about the age that all the capacitors will be going bad, just like uh, we were looking at the NV870, like one of the next models up from this uh, a while back, and that was starting to have problems with its capacitors. So this one here, I'm pretty sure, is a year or so older. Well, like, initially released a year or so before. And so we might find that this one is just as bad or worse in terms of capacitor leakingness. It's got some other notes there. Play, record, something or other. That was in 95, so it has had some other clean. Families with kids. Hard use on VCRs, because you got all those rented tapes for kids' movies and things. And then all that time shifting with stuff for parents. Dirty old tapes getting thrashed in it. I think the colour should just come off. See, this has got the... Oh, the head was stiff. Now it's free. It's got the add-on thing like we saw in that Panasonic, uh, more industrial machine that picks up the hi-fi sound. It's probably got a compatible head. I guess we could take a look at that later. So it's still got that mechanism kicking about. It's got the backup caps. They don't seem to have leaked. Surprising. It's got the standard idler tire thing down there, which will probably be slipping by now. And the pinch roller. Not too bad. It's a belt here, which will probably be gone now. So it might not load very well. We've got this special tape here that we can try that um, allows you to try it out without uh, chewing it up. Let's see. Uh, no joy. So I've switched it on. The light there is on. LED. But there's no sign of clock flashing. 
and that the power button there is dully lit so this suggests it's not in very good shape so we'll need to work out voltages and things to check I remember last time we found there was cracking on the solder joins like in the other machine cracking on solder joins in there where that regulator is and also on these heatsink parts where the other regulators are perhaps we'll take a look at that first and see what's going on and then perhaps we'll have to get out the service manual and start looking at where the voltage rails are for measuring them from memory the other machine has a problem similar to the NV870 where some of the VFD the display segments are on and there's no other sign of life and we found in the NV870 that that was because of those uh, like display driver ICs were all dead so I'm guessing that's a similar problem in that one oh there's some kind of choke thing I was hoping this would just pull out enough that we can look at it. We'll just pull all this stuff out. It's going to turn into a mess anyway. So this clock board should lift up. Oh, and then those ground wires are in the way. Good. Oh, it's not going to help, is it? Because we need to go under there because these wires are trapped. All right, we're going to take the whole thing apart, give it a good looking over. So you take the front off. You also have to take the bottom panel off. Well, you have to take the bottom panel off, then you can get the front off. Then this board can come out. Then we've got to get to the board below it, and then we've got to see what's trapping those wires. Because the front is held on by these screws here, which also hold the bottom on. You've got to be careful because there's a switch on the front at the bottom there for controlling the hi-fi tracking or audio level display that has to be in the right position when you're putting it back okay bottom panel now the front will unclip you see there's a pretty big board on the bottom there pretty sure well it's a very similar board to what's in the 370 model but it is slightly different. Now these will come off. Front panel is removed. This switch here you have to be careful of because that needs to line up with the switch mechanism below when you're putting it back together. Now the timer board there, I don't think that has any extra screws so once this one's lifted up it will come out. This one here, there are two red screws that have to be undone and then that's joined to the bottom board. So they will have to be taken out to unfold the bottom board. All the cables to the bottom board are done down here so it can fold out fully. And these cables here are fairly long so that it can be released without having to undo anything. These clips just need to be pushed in, that's all. Oh, there's some connectors to undo at the front. Which I think are the audio selector things. I think that's what it is. Which means that it will run without those connected the wires to there. Alright, now we can get this out. I think that will just hinge out. Uh, we have to undo some screws. Well, it looks like there was a hinge thing there. But all these have to come out. Now oh, these were red screws. It must have been hot and it's uh, like bleached the color out of them it's faded weird because it is inside the machine okay oh, one of those wires was coming from down below I don't know if I've taken one of these apart before I've taken apart plenty of NV370 machines in the past this seems to have more stuff in it than those like these extra regulators I guess we'll just unplug the wires from it so we can inspect them to see what the soldering is like. That doesn't unplug. What that is for? Extra transformer thing. It's not part of the regulators. And annoyingly those are in there so we can't inspect the soldering. 
Oh, there is some cap leakage there. There's corrosion visible on that jumper there. So some capacitor has leaked. Must be that little one. Oh yeah, one of the super caps has been cut off, so I guess that was leaking. Alright, so that's not a good sign, is it? Have a look on this. Yeah, this port here doesn't exist in the NV370. I guess this will be the Hi-Fi audio board. Let's say that's what that is. This would make sense, that thing that the non-Hi-Fi version doesn't have. Yeah, there's brown wires there coming off the video head. And then they go into that box there. It will be the head amp part for the Hi-Fi audio. Well, that's good. Because this thing here folds out too. If you squeeze that in enough. Let's see what kind of cap leakage we've got going on in there. More than none. Those lighter purpley colored capacitors, which is what we saw in the NV870, those ones were leaking. Yeah, and they are here too. Oh, bad leakage. Bad leakage on that. It's got a cover, so it's hard to see. The other, the black color and the dark blue colored capacitors don't seem to be as bad. There's also light blue capacitors here, which seem to be all right. Yeah, it is not a good sign, is it? I'm two minds about how much we should try getting this thing to go or not. But at least we should look at the regulators and see if there's something easy like those are gone dry joint. We'll take these clips off. And take the board off and inspect those. There's a first bit. Because clearly there's some sort of power supply issue. They look alright. Looking alright and being alright is different. So maybe those are fine. I guess it's possible for something to be fine. One of the first things we do is check the filament voltage across the, the display. If that's not there, then that will be one reason why it's not lighting up. What is this? It's just some kind of transformer. It's got a transistor there. Trans oh, it's a little regulator, isn't it? So it's got a zener, a zener resistor and a transistor. So it's making a simple regulator. And it doesn't look like isolation is that important because the tracks all mingle together. Is that because they wanted to use the same transformer as another model, but they needed additional rail? And so they use this to convert one of the AC voltages into another. And then there's no rectifier on there. So how's that being a regulator? It's a regulator somewhere else. It looks like the transformer is wired up independently of that little transistor zener circuit. So it seems like it's two separate circuits on one board. Strange. Connected by these coloured wires. It is unusual to see these different colours in one wiring loom from these consumer national and Panasonic VCRs. Then notice there's another one down here, which has got different colours in it. It's very unusual. Normally it's just all wires are this colour, or red, or this blue. All of them throughout the whole machine. But all brown. At least all of them within one cable assembly are the same colour pretty much always, but there's a few here which are different. Which is unusual. Okay, well let's put this back in and then see what kind of voltages we can measure to see if we can trace down an easy problem, an easy reason for the problem. Okay, that's just gonna sit in there. That's good. Good, let's pretend that that's done up nicely. And we'll put this down here. And then we'll look up what voltages we need to measure, or what voltage we, what voltages we should measure on the along here under different conditions, and then we'll try that. Find power supply stuff. Here we go. Power supply schematic. Is 
So we've got mains input plug, transformer, then there's two main bridge rectifiers, then there's another positive and negative type of thing going on there, off of one winding. There's AC 3.8 volts. Oh, here we go. That's what that other thing does. Oh, I see. So that transformer, that little one that we were poking about just before, that takes the heater voltage, 3.8 volts, which goes to there and there, and it generates another isolated 3.3 or 3.8 volts AC. So I don't know why that is, but in one of the other um, displays, I guess. I don't know why it says it's the same voltage. Don't know. And then that little regulator there takes the 18 volts and turns it into a 15 volt supply. We can test all that. So there's a connection off to those two regulators. One of those is on this, which is a power supply section of the bottom board, which is where 12 volt regulated is created and 5 volts regulated. Oh, yes, that comes off the cylinder heater. Thing we haven't looked at yet. We'll measure these ones here first, which should give us a regulated 6 volts through that transistor there, an unregulated 14, unregulated 18 and 45, and then there's a control there, a control line to that little regulator there. It says LM off, which is controlled by this power off circuit. The cylinder heater presumably will be active all the time and so it will always be regulating by the look of it so that should always have 5 volts there on that TP1001 and this TP1002 should always have should it always have? No. no that's regulated 12.7 but it looks like that's controlled by this power off signal Is that power off signal pulls steals the base current of that regulator there, and through that diode goes and controls that one. Uh, maybe it does control the 5 volt one as well. Yeah, it looks like it does. Okay, so we won't be able to measure those two because it doesn't show up as on. But what we did see is that the power light was showing red, but it was glowing just a little bit, which suggests that some power rails are there and others aren't, so it's not in the right state. We'll check these unreg voltages first. Seems like a good idea. We can get that like that. The nice ground places there. No, it's not going to be that easy. I think we can use that. Quite long. Anyway, we're going to join up this clip lead to the minus terminal. And then we'll power this up and we'll do some measurements. Just need to work out where, where we're going to start. PD1001. Seems like a good choice, which is that one, which pin 1 is ground, is it? No, it's pin 2 is ground, yes, so that makes sense. So this one here should be unregulated 14 volts. Hmm, okay, well, that's easy then, isn't it? This, really? Maybe we've found the problem. That's dead? Well, that fuse is blown. Let's just check some of the others. Unregulated. 18 should be here. Yeah, that looks like unregulated 18 or unregulated 45. Yeah, 51. Then we've got that LF M, LM off low, which is high, so I guess it's not off. But that there is a concern, and that's pretty fundamental, which almost suggests that that fuse is blown because it doesn't go through anything else, does it? Unless that rectifier is wrecked. That rectifiers don't get wrecked, do they? Which fuse is it? 112, this one. If it's blown though, why is it blown? Yeah, that fuse is blown. 1.6 amps. And it can't be that easy. Let's just measure the resistance then from ground to that power supply rail. 1.3 meg. So it's not shorted. Guess we'll just replace the fuse and see if it works after that. Strange. I'll look for another fuse. Found another fuse. 
that 1.6 amp dead. Here's another one. 1.6 amps, it looks intact, we'll just measure it. Just to make sure. Yeah, it's good. See if it blows, then power's off. And then we'll put that in there, put it to voltage. Stick it in there, and we'll see if it comes up now. Peace. Oh, it blew again, didn't it? See the flash in there. But noise happened. I wonder if that means that something like a motor driver is shorted. Oops. So that once the... Once it gets started, like it tries to start, because I heard... Heard the a motor make a noise then. So maybe there's a short somewhere further down the line so as soon as it powers something up it shorts out oh that's annoying so just wrecked another fuse didn't find any more of that value well I stopped looking but I did pull out some others that are similar there's a 2 amp one I guess we'll try that later so my assumption at the moment is that something like a motor drive has gone short and that might be quite a fiddle to find uh, let's look we might be able to find that if we look at where this goes, this unregulated 14 If that goes to a regulator, then we can measure for shorts on the other side of those downstream regulators So unregulated 14 goes to this Which then turns it into regulated 6 volts So that's one place to go looking So this transistor would have blocked the a short that's on the output side there but also unregulated 14 goes across to here and then that gets turned into regulated 12 and 5 this one here where it turns into 6 volts that doesn't have an enable so that's there, see 6.8 volts zener let's check that one first just to see I was thinking we could try injecting some voltage into it from the power supply and see if it pulls current or not. Is that a good idea? We'll use that same ground. Presumably the ground's shared. And we're looking for rig 6 on P7502, second to last pin, shows 0.4 meg. We'll just prove that's the right one by going. One, two over, that should be ground. Yes, that's ground. Okay, so that regulated 6 volt rail does not appear to be shorted. we check these here now, because that's the next place that that voltage goes to. There's a fusible resistor, so presumably that, well, it depends how closely they've sized it, that could go if something happens. Just looking, where does this 12.7 actually come from unregulated 18 so that's not involved so that's that one there so it means it has to be well that goes to other places we just check where else does that go unregulated 14 that goes well it's not shorted itself we need to check this next tp 1001 let's try and find that just get this a little bit out of the way so that we can tip this thing upside down for better looking at the bottom if we can't get this one working we'll look, move on to another one so there's a power section here it's also interesting there's some unfinished business there they've put in some tracks but there's no holes before a different version so there's these power things and we're looking for TP1001 which will be that one there called TP1 and BP1005 so that's that where that transistor there joins on that's another one which I guess will be that one, one there's 1002 ok so that's that transistor there what we're looking for is this one here ok it's the one that goes to the cylinder head where does that join on? there probably 1506 R7 I think so, if that's 10k then we are looking at the right thing TP1 Yeah, that's R7 
means that's coming off the base. It's 200 ohms, 8 megs in that direction. Is that an acceptable amount of resistance? It's 5 volts, I guess so. There's not that much current flowing. I think 20, 30 milliamps or something. So I guess that's fine. Then we need to look further to where this Unreg 14 goes to see what other things does it power. I expect it would power the motors. System control, servo. Alright, Unreg 14. That's what we're looking for, isn't it? Yes. So I'm fairly sure it doesn't go to very many places at all. So we've got Unrig 14 from the power section. So this is presumably the only place it can go. The track goes along here. Unrig 14. Unrig 14. And then it comes down. This one here. Comes down. There's one tapping there. Which goes into a motor driver for the front loading motor driver. There's a transistor doofy. It says sensor LED and sensor LED drive. And what is that? It's sensor LED, whatever that means. I guess that's the end sensor. Like the start and end sensor, the thing that pokes up through the center of the cassette through that hole there. I think that's what that will be. So this is an enable circuit for that. And then it carries on down here, goes through a diode, then there's an interesting thing going on here, because it also goes into the same pin then of another motor driver, and that's the loading motor. That would be the one that powers up briefly, so I'd suspect that that one's the problem. And what we could do is desolder that diode temporarily, put another fuse in, see if it blows then, and that way we would have discounted this part of the circuit. So I think we'll try that. Try and find D207. And that's a motor driver. Well, it's next, it should be next to a motor driver. And the motor drivers are... They're going to be in the servo part the board. I know the system control part. I know that these exist on this board because I've taken them from an NV370 machine for another. But this does look a little bit different. Maybe because it is. It's those. The other motor drivers. IC6002 and, and IC6003. That says 2 and 3. So we're looking for... Pin 8 of IC3 is this one, pin 8 is there, and there's a diode called D6207. Something for a D207, presumably. It's there. So if we were to poke that diode out, we can do it from this side. So that must be the power supply rail there. It's got R1 on it, R1 there which will be that resistor that comes up to feed that transistor there's the transistor there, Q1 yep, that will make sense okay, so we're going to heat up the soldering iron and we're going to poke that diode out of the way so we don't have to fold the board out, luckily we can just poke it from here single sided, non plated through board so that should be pretty easy then we'll stick in the 2 amp fuse, I guess and we'll see what happens whether we can pop another fuse, or or should we just measure on the other side of that diode? Because it's a diode, it could have blocked the fact that there was a short circuit over there before we go poking things about. There's a diode. Where's the ground? Look, that transistor there. It's got a track with C2, which is that. And that side of C2 there will be ground. So let's just check on... This side of the diode is there. But it could be that when the motor driver turns on, that's when the fault happens, because it could be on the output side of it, or it could be internal in the motor driver itself. And so what's the output of the driver? It's pin 10 and pin 2. 
that's where the motor joins on so let's just measure those 10 and 2 30 ohms that typical motor resistance let's check on this one as well then 45 yeah all right we're going to poke the diode out and see if it uh, changes anything Okay, so that should be disconnected now. Means we'll have to flap the whole board out to put it back though. There we go, that's definitely out of the way now. Put in a new fuse and we'll power it up and we'll see if the fuse blows again. And then we'll know whether it was beyond that default lay, beyond that diode or not. And if the fuse doesn't blow, we'll check then if the clock comes on. Tell us for how many other problems we've got on this machine and whether it's worth abandoning it or not. Alright, we're just putting in a 2 amp because that's just what we're doing. Shouldn't be putting the wrong value fuses in, but I don't really have a choice at the moment. I suppose we could steal ones from the other machines and blow those as well. Let's see, does this stay on now? Or does the fuse blow again? It stays on. Clock is flashing. The power on off thing is not power on offing because that's just, is that the one we disconnected or is that not the one we disconnected all right so we've got some promise the capstan is rotating slightly which suggests another problem but it could just be because of the way the power supply is lacked lacking all right We've proven that we've got a problem uh, beyond that motor driver. Now what? So we've narrowed down the fault a little bit. Well, we've narrowed down the location of the fault. Bit. So we've popped out one end of this diode, which means we no longer have the unregulated 14 volt power supply getting to this part of the circuit. And it looks like the only place that can really go is in pin 8, because that diode there will block it, which I think is just some kind of logic thing to do with where it's powered from, maybe. I'm not really sure what any of that's all about. It's like a flyback. I'm not sure what, what that's about. Unload. Was it a latching circuit with diodes? I think it's just some kind of clamp. I don't know. What is that? What is this business here? It says PF. And there's three of them. And they seem to be related to the clamps. Or the, the those diodes. I'm not really sure what, what the deal is there. Because that looks like a voltage rail clamp kind of thing. That when this point rises up, this voltage will start increasing. Although that's a power supply rail, isn't it? From there, unregulated 18 will start flowing into that point. I guess it means that this motor driver can be powered from multiple sources and that diode blocked from each other. So maybe this one here, this unregulated 14, is only available when the rest of the machine's off. And then when it gets turned on, then these 18 volts, higher voltage, then they power it. It's a bit weird. Perhaps we should test those diodes then, because if the 18 volts was back feeding into the 14 volts, then that might be a reason for the fuse to blow. No, that doesn't make sense because the fuse is it's on the AC side, so that would be blocked by diodes. You wouldn't be able to back feed to blow the fuse. So I'm more suspecting that the motor driver's pooped. Perhaps we should... P Let's open the bottom board out, and then we can inspect it quite closely and see if we can work out what's going on. It's not unusual for those motor drivers to fail because the reason why I dismantled an NV370 a while back was to get one of the motor drivers from it to put into another machine of a completely different model, but it just happened to be close enough. The motor driver IC was close enough that it could be made to work. Well, it fitted. It fit being bent over a bit and was pin compatible, but it wasn't exactly the same part. There's hinges along the back there. So audio, the normal audio, non-hi-fi, 
and servo part and the system control part here it's a main IC there now this front board has to come up and then there's clips and then this will lift up now is that thing there, that board that I was poking there and thinking what is that? it's called sub system control board code BOOC66 yep that's it so that's a strange thing so what I have noticed is there are spiders on the motor driver I see in question spiders so they're not juicy enough to short out such low voltage though are they so you can see the diode that we got poked out that's there there doesn't seem to be any sign of it popping it looks fine and there's more quite crusty capacitors and extremely crusty capacitors more crusty capacitors yeah, not a good look is it okay we could do some ohming ohming ringing out of the two different driver ICs to see whether there's some distances to some differences I also have a signature analyzer or a tracker a hunt tron tracker 1000 we could perhaps use that to compare the functioning of this IC against uh, one in the other board on the other in another machine or against this one let's just do some resistance checking to ground and see if that shows us anything so the fuse didn't blow and that happened why don't we attach a power supply into there let's see what that does is that a good idea well the other thing we could do is see if it's back feeding a voltage into that part of the circuit through those diodes 0.5 volts nope all right well let's feed our own 14-ish volts power supply into there and see if it does anything interesting we use this good thing it's set to 13.6 we'll just turn the current down to sort of half an ampish and it is taking a big gobble of current when the power comes on we've just wound it up a bit Ah, it was on timer record mode, that would be one issue Is that the only issue? Okay, so it turns on and off A small gulp of current is taken Does that mean we're all good now? Let's see if it will accept this Yes, that display works Yep, it accepts a tape in. The motor's slipping though. That's very strange because it doesn't look like it's very inclined to blow fuser at the moment because there isn't really any persistent high current pulse going into there. Even then it's not using power. Which motor was it that we're talking about here? It's gone into a weird state now where it thinks it's on but it's not uh, yeah, so whatever that was has upset it yeah, it's definitely unhappy about something now have we blown another fuse? because now the clock's not flashing and yeah, it's gone back to that state maybe that fuse did blow again for another reason yeah it seems like it's blown the fuse again even though that wasn't connected so maybe there's more to it than that oh look did I drop that from my soldering iron when I was desoldering it? probably that's not going to help did I do that? or was that like that to start with? we need to check the tape yeah it looks like I dropped a blob of solder there without realising it onto that chip which probably hasn't helped the situation and yeah that's not a very good thing and I think half the video wasn't recorded on the screen properly either so that's also great uh, so I guess that fuse is blown again and... but... I don't know, let's see what happens got some others here 1.25 amp let's see if this... thing that's still attached no, it just blew straight away Okay. 
So there are more issues than just that. So maybe that was a red herring that it didn't blow that one time, because it seems like there are more problems. And that just blew again. Yeah, I wonder why. I wonder what we could do to work out what that is. Maybe I'll put. Maybe if we put the diode back and power up with my power supply from the other side instead of using the fuse. Problem is something's going to get really stressed out, isn't it? Whatever has got a problem is going to get upset if we continue to dump current in it. But that way we might be able to, we might be able to find out what it is, even if we end up smoking it really well. Perhaps it's a good thing. It doesn't really matter, we haven't got anything to lose. We've got two more of these VCRs to play with. So I'm not particularly worried if we wreck one of them. Just to find out what was wrong with it. We'll so solder this diode back. And then we'll get this connected somewhere else on the other side. Okay, we got the diode soldered back in. Very really annoyed that I left let a blob of solder fall onto the thing. That's uncharacteristically bad. And we'll replace the the power supply. Yes, those belts aren't too bad. Okay, I wanted to turn it back up around the other way so that we can see it better. And the mechanism, we can poke it while it's running to overcome the slipping of the loading belt. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to clip onto that capacitor there, which is where that unregulated 14 comes in. This, and we'll be able to see there what it does. Yeah, it's powered up like normal, half an amp. And then we'll choose the play. Wow, the head sounds a bit... I think the, the head bearings are wrecked. Wow. Making a racket. But look at that, it entered play mode. The back tension's fine. What are the noise on that thing, though? That's crazy. So, maybe there's an intermittent short on something. The video heads definitely seen better days. Or oh, heard better days? Wow. I wonder what... It's got that problem that the the glue oh no the glue that holds the windings down has come off or well, unglued so they're all flapping about now so that's not very good so I wonder do you think the ones further down inside have come off as well we have to take the whole head apart to work that out let's do that wondering should we try play this machine like with an actual tape I wonder can we just disconnect that will it care don't know just give the head a little bit of a clean and then we'll try running a tape on it and see what it does oh, I didn't check what the take up is like just need to find something to clean the heads on I'm not expecting great things from this but we might as well give it the best chance. Just give us a bit of a token wipe. Alright. We need to find a video cable now. I'm just leaving it on for the time being because it's yeah. I'd give it the best chance it got to perform. Alright, let's see, does this come up? Oh well, it's not gonna do much with that one, but let's just check the take out. Hopefully that doesn't get caught. Uh, it's got minimal take up. Let's try wrecking a tape. Oh no, the capstan's going the wrong direction. I've noticed that problem before. 
Oh, look at that, it's even got a picture. And even with that rumpty head, it's still got a picture. That's quite amazing. The tracking knob. I wonder if it would pick up hi-fi sound. <laughs> We're pushing our luck there. Oh, it's going around the wrong way again. I think, oops, oh, I pushed eject. I think it's due to capacitors or something that the capstan can run the wrong way because there's some threshold that's not quite right. Or is it leaking something else's? I've encountered it on other machines. I'm pretty sure the NV850 I've got that I said did work, I'm pretty sure that has got the problem where the capstan sometimes runs backwards. So I've got it in the hi-fi sound mode by pushing that button on the front. And I could see the light flashing as though it was trying to enter the hi-fi sound mode, which is quite amazing. Oh, it's running backwards again. Oh, that's almost hitting current on it. Perhaps we should crank that up a little bit. Yeah, well, it's, it's not a good look, is it? Because I get the other camera going again. You can see on the front there that's flashing, but I think that's because it's it's shorting out on those coils, I guess, and it's giving a weird signal because that the tracking control here has no response to the rate that that's flashing, so it's not actually detecting hi-fi audio, which it would if that went on solid. It's just, uh, yeah, and. The order there is wrong, but see the tracking doesn't seem to have any effect, so the head is the head's probably not up to speed because it's got whatever that is going on. Maybe what we should do is grab the head out of one of the other machines and try it. Try it in this one. Would it still blow the fuses now that it's done all that? Let's put another one in just to see. Yeah, they're all 1.25 amps. No, it just blows straight away. <laughs> so go figure. <laughs> Works fine when it's running off the power supply, but doesn't work fine on that. Do you think maybe the rectifier's got a short? That's the other possibility, isn't it? That one of the diodes in the rectifier is gone? Okay, let's pull the head out and poke it about a bit. Oh, the wires go under that bracket thing. That's annoying. So those brown wires... Here we go. I just think they put a bit of sleeving around that. Now, do we have to... How do we get the other wires out? And we get, uh, we have to pull this out again to get to the, the other screw. Uh, I think we can just bodge it. If you push hard enough, it will come out. Yeah, I guess the rectifiers, that was... Sh it doesn't make sense, does it? Would that happen if one of the rectifier diodes were gone open? Then the peak current on the other side of the waveform will be a lot higher, and that could lead to the fuse blowing? Is that sensible? thing that could happen? I guess so. If the transformer's got a low enough impedance to deliver that peak current. Uh, yeah, we can unplug it all. That's good. Yeah, that's interesting. Those coloured wires are the ones going to the the head. But, under that. It's a curiosity, so let's take apart the the video head and see why would it be making that noise. Is there something rubbing in there or are the bearings wrecked? Let's say it's probably the bearings wrecked. Unless something's got in there. Got the shield thing. Then we can 
There's a grub screw there, we can take that panel off, but not well, that flywheel kind of thing. Find the right size drive bit for it. Probably that. And there's another one under that stator part. There's some rust on the bottom edge of that screw. Which suggests some moisture's got in there. Yeah, this is the machine that said the heat had been replaced in 1990. I guess they just did the upper drum, because that's what usually happens. We'll get in there a bit closer. take more of this apart, yes we have to undo this part to get that board out oh yes there's more rust ok I think water got in Well, how, why? <laughs> this driver's no good because it can't. doesn't have enough welly. Get some vice grips onto that. Got enough grip on the driver. Oh. Yeah, look at that. The coils are all falling out. Wow. It's amazing how well it worked for how bad condition, and you can see all the glue it's all sitting there, it's all come out and you can get the bearings out of these by tapping it on an angle like that that one's stuck up there, which is unusual because the bearing normally stays in that side but yeah, that feels rough Yeah, because the bearing stayed in the top bit, which is very unusual. I don't think we can get that out easily because it's now up there. Pull it, get it to seat back in, and then get the top bit to pop off, or the shaft to let go instead of the bearing. I don't think so. I think it's another wrecked bearing up there. That one there is definitely wrecked because when I turn that, I can. Feel it, you can hear it too. Bearings are wrecked. Wow. Must have seen a lot of hours then to get like that. That's that's quite amazing. I don't have an axle pull or anything that I can use to get that out. You can get it well, you can get closer to it by taking this top piece off. And then taking the top of the head drum off. And then take that off. I think it will still be inside an enclosed part though. Because that's normally how you... Oh, you got to desolder those bits before you can get it off. The ones with the arrows pointing to it. Then it will separate this part from it. But the bearing's still going to be stuck inside there. Anyway, we can't investigate that because it'll be stuck inside there. But, yeah, look at the... yeah, I cracked that in the process. Anyway, that's metal recycling material now. That got ruined as well. Let's get... let's tidy this mess, and we'll open up the machine that had the bits just floating around inside it, and we'll perhaps steal the head out of that, and stick it in this machine and see if it plays a little bit better, just for fun. I will clean this up first. Okay, I've opened up the other machine, the one that had stuff rattling around it. Look at that! A film container was used to hold the screws because it's not put back together properly. It's a CD player though, but they're actually screws from another machine because the side panel, the side screws to the panel were silver coloured, not black coloured like they should have been. So I guess it's been a mix up. Anyway, this is loose. Interesting, that fuse has been replaced on this one again because it's not the original one with the coloured bands on it like that. It's just a plain glass one. This 
can tell the wires are wrecked, the little RF wires are ruined in that as well. Disappointing. So it's probably not going to be much better, but I want to know, are the bearings good in this one? Let's just pull that off in case it's these top ones that are the problem. Oh, that's not very good, is it? There's corrosion all around that. And that's the internal ones. Oh, that's a shame. At least we got a good one of this top part that isn't corroded. But I think the internal windings are all ruined as well. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, those wires are gone. Oh, that board's are not screwed. And I was just going to say we should turn this on to see what happens, but I don't think that's a good idea because that's not even attached. But I was thinking maybe we take this power supply out and stick it in the other one and see if that um, helps. Perhaps we'll just get the head out for now. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Depends how I feel about going further. We've spent quite a lot of time on this already. But, yeah, I do want to know what... Why is that fuse blowing? Oh no, the screw fell down in there. Okay, video head. Sounds pretty bad. It doesn't have that grinding sound though, like the other one did. So I guess that's a benefit. It's not quite as bad. Oh, did that screw fall out? I think it did. Don't know where it went. Okay, we'll mount the head in this one. Gotta get these wires connected. Yes, it's sitting in. Get that thing positioned so it's not munting the... Oh no, it's corroded on that side of the wires. Not as bad though. Okay, we'll screw the head in. Try not to drop the screws into the machine. Okay, that's done up. Just for completeness, we'll put back the Hi-Fi audio pickup. Okay, give it a little bit of a wipe. Good luck. I should have done that before we put the that top thing back on. Yeah, it's pretty dirty that head. You just want it not clogged, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just so that we can get the best chance of getting a picture out of it. Given all the leaking capacitors and other problems, I think the head being slightly dirty is the least of the trouble for the picture. Alright, that's that'll do us for that. Do we need to do anything else? Need to get it to power up without blowing something. Okay, we've got our 13 volts supply. Good, it's done a sort of powery up move. Go straight for a good tape. Wow, a test tape. Well, that sounds much better, doesn't it? I guess the alignment will be a bit wrecked now. There's yes, something is messed up with the tracking. Should we try ruining the alignment by adjusting those posts? Might as well, we've ruined everything else while we're here. Well, we'll just give it a little tweak. Oh, is the tape crapped out? No. Might as well try giving the alignment a little bit of a tweak just to. So let's see what's going on. I think it's okay as it is. I think the main problem is those, the little, the wires in there, the, the RF transfer thing flapping about is not going to be the best for it. That's going to cause disturbances in the picture because it will interfere with the signal. Just pull a little bit over one amp for a while. Well, when the loading mode is running. I wonder if the mechanism's jammed up enough from the grease going bad that it's causing the the current to be too high. It doesn't make sense. They wouldn't um, size a fuse that close, would they? Shouldn't do. Well, we were blowing a fuse that's uh, higher rated than the original one. The picture looks a lot better on my screen than it does on the capture screen. 
but still the tracking is not very good. All right, that's the uh, NV, that's the NV850 National or Panasonic, depending on how they were feeling on the day. But one last thing we'll check is the diodes on the power supply board. So we're gonna have to pull that out and poke around on it. So we'll unplug the machine. Important. So we kind of got it going a little bit. We're gonna have to lift this up again. And it's a little bit sad about the. I keep saying it thousands of times. It's a bit sad about the transformer. Head RF transformer. Wow, that's very crusty. There's a connection BP1006 that's super crusty looking. It was the. This goes to one of those regulators. That one. It's interesting because it's on the same power supply rail, isn't it? That we're having the problems with. That makes the regulated 6 volts. Maybe that's intermittent. Maybe that's why it was blowing. Oh uh, yeah, it's a dry joint. So maybe the diodes are fine. Can we measure them in circuit without having a problem? Try. Oh, I don't think you can properly measure them in circuit. Well, a couple of them are 0 0.5. 0 0.6, you're seeing the other ones. So either they've shorted yeah, that shows nothing. Maybe there is a shorted diode. Perhaps we should take them out and measure them. Try desoldering the diodes and then we can measure them out of circuit. Oh, they're not going to properly desolder, are they? Oops. Yeah, just as well, I've got some replacement tips for this thing. They get melted away. Okay, those should pull out. Yeah, look at that. Alright, let's check the diodes out of circuit. Assuming we can find them. There's one. Four diodes. Should be good. Blocked. Block. No. Wait, wait a minute. Block? Yes. Conduct? Yeah, that's shorted. There you go, that's why the fuse was blowing. That diode's dead. No wonder it was blowing. Yeah, that would have given the capacitor a hard time too. That one's fine. That one's fine. Okay, so the reason for the fuse blowing is this diode's gone short circuit. It's an E4B diode. What was? It's not anymore. There you go. Found this. Found the problem. Got a shorted diode. That was fun. Tune in next time. Perhaps we'll take a look at another one of these 850s, or maybe we'll move on to something else. Depends how I'm feeling, I guess. Probably done enough on this. We're not gonna get it. Yeah, because of the, all the capacitors leaked, we're not gonna get it up in full working condition unless we spend a lot of money and a lot of time uh, to make a shopping list, buy all the capacitors, swap them all out, clean up all the corrosion, and yeah, I'm not really keen on doing that. Oops, the diode's going flying. So I think we'll just leave it there and we'll take a look at a different machine next time. So hopefully that was good. It was interesting, I think. And it's quite satisfying to find the cause of the problem. And maybe we should have thought about that at the start, but it really did look like it was that motor driver thing because as soon as we opened that diode on the main board, the fuse didn't blow anymore. I think it's just because we removed a bit of load at startup and it just happened to not blow that one time. 
Anyway, there you go. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and all that business. And we'll do something else exciting next time. A few more things that I'm just thinking about while tidying up. Possibly this die had gone short because of the bad connection on that 6 volt regulator. It could have been um, intermittently connecting and causing some high peak currents which stress the diode. That's possible. And the other thing is, head bearings going bad. I've never seen a ball bearing head bearing go bad like that. Well, I've fairly limited experience though. But I, definitely the types of heads that use the oil thrust type bearings and not ball bearings, those definitely go bad because the oil dries out or crusts over and then yeah, they don't float anymore, they just vibrate. But yeah, that was the first time seeing a, a ball bearing get that bad in a video head. So there you go. The things you find. I'm sure we'll find a lot, a lot of other interesting things along the way as we explore the VCRs I've got piled up here.